For the next two Sundays, we'll be taking a break from our series on Jonah on Palm Sunday and Easter Sunday. But today we begin chapter 2 and the first seven verses of the book of Jonah. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight, yet I shall again look upon your, your holy temple. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. The weeds were wrapped about my head at the, foot, at the, at the roots of the mountains. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. When my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Let us pray. Lord, as we look at this wonderful prayer of Jonah today, we pray, Lord, that you would give us the same passion for you, that we would see the hope which we have in Jesus Christ our Lord. And so we pray, Lord, that you would speak your words of truth to us now and that we would know the peace of Christ now and always. In his precious name. Amen. Jonah chapter 2 contains what has been called one of the Bible's great prayers. Especially when we realize that up until this point, there is no record of Jonah praying. Jonah didn't pray because he didn't want to talk to God. Chapter 1 verse 3 says, Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with him to Tarshish away from the presence of the Lord. The whole point of him trying to flee to Tarshish was to get away from God. So Jonah almost certainly would not have prayed for the Lord's guidance in the middle of his sin and rebellion. Prayer is so important because Jonah's story is, is a good lesson for us. Disobedience leads to prayerlessness. Prayerlessness can lead to sin, which more often than not can lead to disaster. So the question we need to ask is, what changed for Jonah? You remember that while still on board the ship, he ignored the captain when the captain pleaded with him to pray to his God. But now things have changed. And the reason is that God has brought Jonah low, but he has done so as an act of grace. Jonah is now facing the consequences of his rebellion. He is separated from God, and he is now quite alone, and he's destitute. We might not be on as dramatic a journey as Jonah is, or was, when we, when we drift away from God. But when we do find ourselves doing that, whether intentionally or not, the destination is the same. A place of darkness. We were created by God, and we were created for God. And any life lived away from Him is a life of darkness and despair. Psalm 86 verse 15, this is the New King James Version, says, You, O Lord, are a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in mercy and truth. And this is the wonderful lesson which Jonah was about to learn. Now, to all intents and purposes, Jonah's life was at an end in the stomach of this great fish. But because of God's grace, he now finally turned to the Lord in prayer. And it's sad that like Jonah, we often pray as a last resort. But in his grace and mercy, God will still hear those prayers. Another feature which makes this one of the Bible's great prayers is not just the fact that Jonah prayed, but also the substance of his prayer. And we'll get into more detail on that. He showed no anger towards God. Because Jonah knew that the situation he found himself in was entirely his own fault. He acknowledged that it was God who had brought him into the deep, and only God could rescue him. In verse 3 he says, For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Now it was the sailors who physically threw him overboard. And this was Jonah's idea. But he understood that it was actually the sovereign hand of God that had cast him into the depths of the sea. It was your waves and your billows that passed over him. So Jonah understood that everything that had happened to him 
while it was caused by God, it was his sin which was behind that. And remarkably, at no point in his prayer does Jonah express any anger or resentment to God. He'd reached the point where he realized this is all his fault. He said to the sailors in, in chapter 1 verse 12, I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. And he also knew that it was because of his sin that he was dying inside that fish. Jonah has made some very bad decisions so far, and there are more to come. But he showed in this particular case tremendous spiritual maturity in his prayer. By not turning against God, but instead by turning against himself and his sin. Sometimes it's only when we are near our own breaking point that we realize that God in Christ has the answer to our greatest need. And Jonah learned this lesson the hard way. When it finally seemed that all was lost, Jonah confessed his sin. Now he knew that it was only God who could help him. And so he cried out in verse 2, I called out to the Lord out of my distress. It's been said many times that in our fallen state, when we have somewhere else to turn instead of prayer, we will choose that option first. So long as we are able to fool ourselves into thinking that we can work all things out on our own, we will try anything. But eventually when we do come to our senses and we do turn to God, we will find that in His grace and His mercy, He comes to us, just like the father in the parable of the prodigal son. And there are times when the very best thing that can happen to us is the thing that we dread the most. Because it removes our self-reliance. It humbles our foolish pride. And it reminds us that our only hope is to be found in God. Jonah, just like us at times, was driven to the point of utter despair before he turned to the Lord in prayer. But at least he prayed. Pride is always a bitter, a bitter pill to swallow, but it is so necessary for us in our walk with God. 1 Peter 5, from verses 5 to 7, says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him, because he cares for you. And for Jonah to recognize the futility of his rebellion against God and to turn to him in humility and repentance, he first had to be brought to his knees, just as he does with us. And because we struggle to willingly humble ourselves before God, he in his grace, and because of his great love for us, he will do it for us, if that is what it will take, which is what happened in Jonah's case. We have all made bad decisions, which have brought us to our knees before God. But what about those occasions when we find ourselves in a desperate situation through no fault of our own? The examples we looked at last week, the examples of Job and Joseph, often spring to mind. Their tremendous struggles were not the result of their own personal sin, yet they suffered tremendously. So what do we do? With, how, how do we answer that? Well, it's to be found firstly in the absolute sovereignty of God. And also in understanding that he is perfect in his holiness, his justice, and his goodness. We have to acknowledge that God is the sovereign, saving Lord. And just as Jonah had to learn to bow to God's sovereign call in his life, we need to learn to do the same. We sing the songs about submitting to God, but do we really? But we'll find that as we grow in grace and in the knowledge of God, we need to learn to bow to God as the Sovereign Lord in every purpose and in all of our circumstances as well. Sometimes God calls us to repent of our sin and rebellion. There are times when we know exactly why everything seems to be unraveling around us. And God calls us to repent of those things. While there are also occasions when we cannot see the reasons and we cannot see His purposes. But in either situation, God calls us to humility and to rely on his sovereignty and his grace. God is God and we are not. So we need to learn to surrender to him as the God of grace. So Jonah's prayer is a wonderful lesson to us because of his utter despair 
And it was in that despair that he remembered the grace of God. In verse 4, he acknowledged that all was lost, but he still remembered the grace of God. I am driven away from your sight, yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. And we need to learn to do the same. We need to cry out to God for mercy. And we need to echo Jonah's words in verse 2. When he said, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. I mentioned the importance of the substance of Jonah's prayer as a lesson to us. And you might have noticed that Jonah at no point prays, Lord, please just get me out of this mess. Instead, his prayer was a reflection of what he already knew about the nature of God. William MacDonald wrote in his commentary, There is not one word of petition in Jonah's prayer. It consists of thanksgiving, contrition, and rededication. It is really a psalm of praise, a doxology. Jonah would have known the psalms almost off by heart. So it is no coincidence that his prayer seems to have been taken straight out of the psalms. So we need to have a closer look at the, at the significance of his prayer. In the side notes or footnotes in most Bibles, you'll find cross-references. Whenever something is quoted from another verse in the Bible, the references are there, whether they are directly quoted or referred to. Probably the best known example we have is Jesus' cry whilst, while on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Both Matthew 27 verse 46, where that is mentioned, and Mark 15 34, they both cross-reference Jesus' cry to Psalm 22 verse 1. And in Jonah's prayer in chapter 2, he either directly quotes from or refers to Psalms 3, 5, 16, 18, 31, 42, 50, 65, 88, and Psalm 120. Ten of them in those verses. The 4th century uh, theologian Athanasius, he wrote, I believe that a man can find nothing more glorious than the Psalms, for they embrace the whole life of man, the affections of his mind, and the motions of his soul. To praise and glorify God, he can select a psalm suited to every occasion, and thus will find that they were written for him. In our Wednesday morning Bible study, we are slowly working our way through the psalms. And probably the most valuable lesson we have learned so far is that whatever situation we may find ourselves in, at any moment in our lives, from the most wonderful to the most desperate, the Psalms mirror those emotions. The Psalms teach us about God and about ourselves. They teach us about life and death, about despair and hope, about fear and faith. It, it's a rhetorical question, I know, but do you ever struggle to pray? Pray through the Psalms. Robert Godfrey of Ligonier Ministries, he wrote a book, and the title, the title is Learning to Love the Psalms. And this is what he writes in the, in, in the introduction. He says, the more you dig into the Psalms, the more you discover. Like all great poetry, the Psalms are like a mine with ever new depths to reach and ever more gold to find. They reward abundantly whatever effort we make to know them better. The Psalms teach us how to express our emotions to God in all the circumstances of our lives. And this is what Jonah did. Remember, he would have been raised knowing the Psalms. He had recited and sung them throughout his life. And now, at the lowest point of his life, moved to prayer, he prayed the Psalms. Godfrey also wrote in his book that he was once asked to name his favorite book in the Bible. And his first thought was that as a Christian, he shouldn't have a favorite because they're all equally important. Now, he does have a point. But he soon realized that for him, it was the Psalms. And that was the inspiration to, to write his book. John Calvin wrote of the Psalms. i had been accustomed to call this book, I think not inappropriately, an anatomy of all the parts of the soul, for there is not an emotion of which anyone can be conscious that there is not here represented as in a mirror. So in the Psalms, we read of people in all kinds of circumstances, including people in need and desperate distress. And they're calling out to God. And almost without exception, every cry 
And every complaint that we have ever poured out to God is echoed in the Psalms. And also in the Psalms we are reminded of the answer to those cries, the mercy and the grace of God. The Psalms deal with every human emotion, every human experience, every high and low. And all of them in such a way that when we read them carefully, we will find ourselves drawn to God in faith. In Mark chapter 9, Jesus healed a demon-possessed boy. And the father of the boy said to Jesus in verse 24, I believe, help my unbelief. Have those words not ever struck you as, struck as rather strange? I believe, help my unbelief. But that's the picture of every believer, every Christian. If that is your cry, you would do well to turn to the Psalms. And Jonah's story teaches us so much about turning to God in repentance and appealing to Him for mercy and grace when He needs it, when, when we need it. Jonah's call begins with this, with this challenging command from God, and his faith is severely tested by his call to go and preach in Nineveh. The sin of his hatred of the Ninevites drove him away from God. And he tried to find the answer to his problem on the ship headed for Tarshish. How many Tarshish-bound ships do we turn to when we struggle with the commands of God? But God was so gracious to Jonah, just as he is with us, because he will use even our darkest moments to draw us to himself. And the best way to do that, the best way to be reminded of that, and to experience the grace of God is to turn to his word. 1 Peter 1, 23. You have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. The grace of God that we need is found and experienced as we spend time in the scriptures, in the word of God. And the theme or the substance of Jonah's prayer is found in the opening statement in verse 2, and in God's gracious answer to him. I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. First, Jonah recognized his true situation. Then he remembered this relationship that he had with the Lord in spite of his rebellion. And so he appealed to God's grace for sinners like himself. And in verses 5 and 6, he described the situation that he found himself in because of his sin. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped about my head at the roots of the mountains. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. That is what sin does to us. But by the grace of, by the grace of God, we pray that we won't have to go through what Jonah did. But we, like Jonah, often feel that we are separated from God. That's what Jonah wanted. He wanted to be separated from God. But now that he had it, in the most dramatic way, he was utterly miserable. It was St. Augustine many years ago who said, You have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it rests in you. The whole point of Jonah's flight from God was to get away from him. And, but that was the worst place for him to be. In John chapter 6, the teachings of Jesus challenged many people. And we pick up the text from verse 66. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the twelve, Do you want to go away as well? And Peter's answer is just remarkable. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. This is before Peter's denial of Jesus. But he made that wonderful confession. Jonah knew that he was separated from God because of his sin of rebellion against the word of God. He also knew that it was because of the sin that God had brought him as low as he was. But what he knew about God reminded him that there was hope. God's promise of grace remind, uh, remained despite Jonah's sin. He had deserted God. But the very fact that he was still alive showed that God had not completely deserted him. And we have the same hope. And Paul puts it so well at the end of Romans chapter 8. When he writes, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution 
or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present or things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. That is the tremendous promise that we have in the word of God. He said to his people through the prophet Jeremiah in chapter 31, I have loved you with an everlasting love. And in chapter 32, he says, I will not turn away from doing good to them. God does not promise us an easy passage through this life. But it is when we're in those times of deep despair that we, like Jonah, can turn to him in repentance and faith. Jonah's prayer teaches us about God's grace for sinners. And there is a key phrase in verse 4. He says, I am driven away from your sight, yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. Why does Jonah specifically mention the temple here? Now the context is important. Jonah lived in Old Testament times. And the temple was the place where the Ark of the Covenant, which was the symbol of the presence of God, was kept. It was at the temple where the sacrifices were performed by the priests. It was for this very purpose of the, the sacrifices that the temple was built in the first place. Because it was there that the blood of sacrificial animals was shed as a symbol of God's forgiveness of sin. And Jonah remembered that God had ordered sacrifices as a way of restoring sinners to himself. So the temple was where Jonah knew he would be restored to God because of the blood of the sacrifices. It's because of what God had done for him that he could be restored. Now for us, the temple is no longer necessary. But the sacrifice that it pointed us to is. Jonah's prayer is a model for our own prayer of salvation. What Jonah looked to in faith was fulfilled in the atoning death of Jesus Christ. So in our despair and in the depths of our separation from God because of our sin, we are reminded of the cross of Calvary. And the great hope that we have because of that. Regardless of how far your sin has driven you from God, you need to know the mercy and the grace He offers you because of what Christ has done for you. Look to the cross as a reminder of His great love for you. John wrote in 1 John chapter 2, the first two verses, My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not, on, not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And then Paul also wrote in, in Romans 8 again, from verse 31, If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Why would God desert us when he's paid such a price for us? Whatever trials and suffering we experience in this life, whether they be the direct result of our own personal sin or not, we look to the cross of Christ as proof of the love of God. Not only that, but it is only when we view life through the lens of the cross that we're able to make sense of both our joys and our suffering. Jonah finally realized the danger he was in due to his sin, but he remembered the saving grace and mercy of God. We'll take a closer look at the final two verses of his prayer when we continue our series after Easter, but we can't end today without noticing Jonas's victorious cry, which has strengthened the hearts and the faith of Christians throughout the ages. And we find it in verse 9, salvation belongs to the Lord. It is only God who can save. And Jonah finally realized and understood that wonderful truth, and his life was changed. Now he knew that God had sent him into the deep, dark, deep darkness, into the great fish, not to destroy him, but to save him. Have you seen and understood God's saving purposes in your life? God's intention is not to destroy you in your suffering. Again from Romans 8, 16 and 17. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him, 
in order that we may also be glorified with Him. And we need to come to the same point that Jonah did. He finally learned that even in his darkest moment, God was not destroying him, but saving him. He is saving you. He is restoring us from sinful rebellion, from our foolish self-reliance, our ignorant pride and our unbelieving stubbornness, so that we can learn to turn to him for the grace that we need. Jonah's prayer should be our prayer. And the opening and closing verses of that, of that prayer say it perfectly. This is verses 2 and 9. I called out to the Lord out of my distress and he answered me. Salvation belongs to the Lord. We have the benefit of living on this side of the cross. Jesus Christ is our salvation. When the angel explained the meaning of Jesus' name to Joseph, he said you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. That is why he came into the world. Not to teach us how to live a better life. He came to save us. So while we can see our own story of rebellion in the life of Jonah, the main point of the book of Jonah, and indeed the whole Bible, is that God the Son took on human flesh, bore our sins on the cross, and was raised for our justification. That is the great hope that we have because of him. Like Jonah, we've all tried to flee from God in our sin and our rebellion. But grace and forgiveness is found in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. God himself has provided the way to eternal life through the death of Christ. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you for your mercy shown to us. We read the story of Jonah and we have to confess it is a sad reflection of our own lives at times when we have willfully ignored your word and we have found ourselves as a result of that in utter despair yet in your great love and your mercy you have reached into our situation and you've drawn us to yourself what a wonderful promise we have so lord particularly now over the next couple of weeks as we contemplate the cross and the empty tomb once more we pray that you'd remind us that your mercy and your grace is sufficient for us we confess, Lord, that too often we, be, we have forgotten that. And so we bless you for, for the cross of Christ. Thank you that you have saved us. Thank you that salvation belongs to the Lord. And we bless you in Christ's name. Amen.